Yeah. Hello, hello. I lovely started to... recording. Yeah, lovely to see new faces, familiar faces. Welcome everyone, yeah. Carolyn. Please, our, our favorite thing to do, drop in the comments where you're from. This is our, that's become a little ritual for us, hasn't it, Gabrielle? Yeah, absolutely. We've got two Daphne. I love that. What, what a coincidence. Very nice. <laughs> too, <huh? laughs> I see Larissa. I haven't seen your face in a while. Hi, oh, New Zealand. Wow. Oh, lovely. Jeremy Stewart. Hello. Jeremy, you names. Hi, Carolyn. Thank you for always coming and supporting. Yeah, there's <laughs> Carolyn. Good to yeah. see you, Carolyn. Yeah. Hello, Louisa. Hi. Hi, hi. Hi, Daphne. Oh, in Bristol. I love that. Mm, very good. Okay. Olena. Yeah, there's some, definitely some different names. There's even a Carrie. I wonder who that is. I don't think that's me. Oh, no, she's in Bristol. Hi, Carrie in Bristol. I'm Carrie in Atlanta. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> oh. Oh, All right. Well, should we go ahead and get started? Indeed, we should. Yes. Welcome. Okay. Everyone. Welcome. I'll, I'll just start with our little um, intro here. I'm Carrie McKinnon, co-founder of the International Language Coaching Association. And Gabriela Kovacs is just here. The, other co-founder. We are extremely uh, pleased, excited, thrilled to be bringing this subject um, to you all today. Uh, if you know anything about ILCA, you know that we're extremely dedicated to connecting and accompanying and supporting language learners through the work that we do by training uh, language coaches in our um, flagship feel program with live sessions restarting uh, in two weeks from now. So not too late to join, but yeah, that, that's what we're all about. And we also do this expert series where we invite in the people that are doing this very important work all over the globe to talk about the work that they are doing. And this particular event today, we are featuring Kathy Ellis, who is a dear uh, friend and colleague and ILCA supporter. We've met her through ILCA in a very important part of our uh, network. And, you know, there's been a lot of discussion at ILCA behind the scenes about how well suited language coaching is to support refugees on their, um, you know, cultural and linguistic uh, integration and learning curve as they, um, you know, integrate into the various countries where they might land. So it is in that vein that we are hosting this today and so thrilled to have Kathy sharing her experience in taking these very bold steps to do this and to document it in such detail and, and put it all in context for us. This is this a really this is a big one for us. Every one of these is, but this one kind of really means a lot because it is, as I said in the the newsletter, if you're on our mailing list that went out yesterday, this is this is a humanitarian act, and um, we're extremely proud to be featuring this. So, thank you, Kathy, and I'm going to hand it over to you, uh, Gabrielle. You. Would you like to say anything before we jump off? Or? Oh well, I've seen the slides, so get ready for an amazing <laughs> ride. It's going to be fantastic, and it's something very close to my heart too. Because I think anyone who's a teacher or a trainer or coach somehow wants to be in a very supportive role. And I think blending these two, supporting refugees in situations that I think many of us cannot even imagine and to transition them in a way in, in another country and help them to, to find their, their footing um, from the perspective of language and communication and culture. And, anything else that's related and on board for today. So I think it's it's uh, super important. And I hope we, we're starting a conversation around it because it's very much missed from, from a professional perspective. So looking forward to this, absolutely. And uh, thank you very much, Kathy, for uh, accepting our invitation to do this talk today. So well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And of course, I appreciate ILCA. I think it's a wonderful organization. So thank you for your invitation. It is a 
very new topic, uh, somewhat, at least for Ilka, and it was a, an, an amazing new experience for me, and I really want to share this. I am not the expert. Um, we can share. I want towards the end of the presentation, we share our thoughts, we share our experiences, our insights, and this is probably a first of many that will follow related to refugees. So one way to remember my name is my last name because Ellis Island and receives immigrants and I really do work with immigrants for the most part. I do mostly corporate training and university training. Uh, but mostly corporate, it's language and culture. And I always say you can't really separate language and culture, hence communication. So we've got these three themes going on. Sometimes I'm going to be separating them. Sometimes they're going to go right into a blend. And this is our agenda for today. Just a little bit of background on the world and then narrow it down to the area that I live in and Carrie lives in, Atlanta, Georgia case studies, I want to share a wonderful tool with you, which is Cultural Wizard. It's fantastic. Maybe you've heard of it. Okay, so let's go to the next. And uh, I love to share my resources too at the end. So refugees around the world, 89.3 million forcibly displaced. And that's internally moving within the country, moving to neighboring country, asylum seekers. Where are they coming from? largely South Sudan, Syria, Afghanistan, Myanmar, and Venezuela. There are over 80 million humans displaced globally, fewer than 1% considered for resettlement. Family members are often separated and in different countries. So I put the definition of refugee a person who flees for refugee or safety, especially to a foreign country, another country. Political, economic, religious, safety. Seeking safety. Next slide, Carrie. Thanks. So we're going to narrow it down. Um, Atlanta is a little bit of background on Atlanta. It's, a cap it's more or less the capital of the south part of the U.S. It's got I don't mean to say capital, it's one of the larger cities. It's got like about 7 million in the area. It's about a six or seven hour drive from Orlando. So that gives you some geographical distance. The administration before Biden closed the door on lots of newcomers, different visa status, refugees. With the new presidential administration with Biden, his administration welcomes 95,000 Afghans to the United States, partly because of the responsibility of the war in Afghanistan. So 1,700 are anticipated to come to Georgia. Hundreds of are going to Clarkston. Now, where's Clarkston? East of Atlanta. It's a suburb of Atlanta, east of Atlanta. It houses people from all over the world, in fact, 50% are foreign born that have a residence in Clarkston. And I heard Carrie say earlier, it's considered one of the most diverse places in the United States. So that gives you an idea of the diversity of refugees and non-refugees that are settling in this area. What happened was, is that Part of the challenge that Atlanta faces and other cities too, is that all of a the sudden there's this taxing on the system because the door was closed, now it's open. So what becomes critical are the, is the housing, um, medical, getting the kids in school. And so these are challenges that are ongoing. Another statistic that I found kind of amazing is that 85% of refugee households in Georgia are economically self-sufficient within six months of arrival. I find that really amazing to, to get the adaptation process going and to find a job, to work and so forth. It's not easy. Other refugee groups that are coming to the Atlanta area are from the north part of Central America like Honduras, Mexico, El Salvador, Myanmar, Venezuela, and Syria, aside from Afghanistan. 
Afghans. Uh, next slide, please. Also, I was told that it's not the term for people from Afghanistan is Afghans rather than Afghani. So my experience with refugees, I started in the 90s. <laughs> Seems like a short time ago. But I was working with refugees from Russia and at a Jewish center here in Atlanta. And the second experience that I had was kind of a mix where I got involved in an adult education class with ESL. And I noticed more and more that there were people from Afghanistan in the class. And this is all virtual too. Afghanistan, Syria, Venezuela. I started to become interested. And I said, you know what? I'm going to make a call. We all have a calling, right? So I'm going to make a, a goal for myself. I want to go into uh, language coaching as for my practice with women from Afghanistan. So that's how the road started. Okay, next slide. Thanks. There's no cost. I did a pro bono. This is from my heart. And I said, okay, in exchange, I'd like to learn more culturally about Afghanistan. So can you teach me the mindset, the way of looking at things? Can you let me know when my Americanness kind of goes past the surface and I need to put on a different pair of glasses for my lens? So it was a wonderful exchange. I've had three. And they were all from Kabul. The language is Dari, which is much like Farsi. And that's why many Afghans, they go to Iran. They feel very comfortable in Iran. The government, they say the government is closed, but the people are open. So there is a, a, a compatibility between Iran and Afghanistan. These ladies were verbal, communicative, lively, upbeat. It was, they were just thrilled that they would be a part of this project. All three had career aspirations. This is one thing that they really like about living outside of Afghanistan. They can pursue their career and pursue the education. The ages range from, I had one in the 20s, one in the 30s, and one in the 40s. I put the marital status because that does make a difference in, in the culture, in the culture within Afghanistan. And two were married, one is not. They called me dear in, in the writing. They would say, dear. And I didn't have the heart to say, well, I accepted, but I thought that was a very interesting to have that dear in, in the emails and then in the written communication. Everything was in the virtual platform. Okay, next slide, please. The first one that I had was a surgeon. She's in her 40s. She fled from Iran. Um, that fled, I'm sorry, fled from Afghanistan, went to Iran, and then decided, okay, to apply. And she came to Houston, lived there for one year, felt like Atlanta was a better place. Came with her three children and her husband, who's also a doctor. She lives right near me. And we had a chance to meet for the first time outside of virtually. And it was just lovely. I would show pictures, but I want to respect their Muslim woman. And I want to respect that. Completely fluent. And her goal was to pass that medical exam. If you would know how rigorous that medical exam is, that's a, that's a lofty goal. So we had to one of our goals was, how are we going to get the resources? How are we going to do this? She also was, was concerned about her time management. And she had three children. So she was very concerned, how can she get in that time to study? She loves to study. Part of the challenge, too, was she would get on the, um, the political forums with other Afghans. And what she realized regarding her time management was, that it was so upsetting to her to be hearing about the news and about people's problems and all of that. And even when she got off the forum, she would spend hours thinking about it. And that took her away from her goals. It upset her. And so she realized, she said, I'm going to have to say, I live here in the US. This is my life. And she came to that conclusion not necessarily forgetting 
where she comes from, but she said she can't go on those political forums anymore. It was just too upsetting. Okay, next slide, thank you. So I divided each case study approaches, successes, and challenges. And so in the approaches, different coaching, I had to be very careful, and this is true with all three cases, the types of questions. I learned that I should not be asking questions regarding obstacles. And so I learned that I had to reframe the question and stay away from when I learned who they were from possible triggers. Keep it more language focused, but also address whatever is keeping them away from their goals. So you can see on the, on the slide, and, and I'm happy to answer all questions at the end, um, about 10 more minutes maybe, but I'm just gonna set up this scenario here. So in this, now what worked was tiny habits. So I did this, I don't know if you can see it. It's a wonderful resource, Tiny Habits by PJ Fogg. And this is the idea that whatever tiny, how tiny, how habits are formed and how we celebrate the process going in there, uh, whatever the goal may be. And it's a very interesting book. It's a very interesting approach. I really recommend it. So I did a lot of that. How do we create these habits that support the goals? Her success, there were many. Now I had eight sessions with her for one hour. And the other two, I had just four sessions. We did a lot. And so one that was particularly interesting for me, she was giving, she was invited to do a virtual seminar for Afghan women and doctors in the country of Afghanistan. So she had to get up in the middle of the night and do a two hour seminar for her fellow doctors. I thought that was really interesting. And we worked really hard on the design and how to gain the trust. She was very concerned how to gain the trust. So in certain cultures you have, trust is more difficult than other to, to, to gain. And so in the context of Afghanistan is the trust level. US, not so much. Okay, so that was part of it. A big thing for all three of these ladies were community resources. What is available that you don't, you don't it doesn't cost an arm and a leg, going to the library, things like that. So these things kind of came up. Uh, challenges for me was my Americanness um, getting in the way. And so I really had to think about kind of going in there where it interfered. I mean, we can't absolutely, that's who I am. Um, but it's, it, you know, it's to be aware of that. And when was it? So I would, I would just say, is my American sticking out too much? <laughs> she goes, <laughs> you know? so it was it was it became fun and she also had financial restrictions so we were looking for resources that didn't cost anything uh, let's go to the next we'll go to case two i had a hematologist so she was in iran and and this is a family member of the first of the surgeon and that's how i got her and she was completely fluent and she was interested in a PhD and at first was the US, but she said it's very difficult to come in. And so she was looking at Canada, she was looking at Sweden. Sweden is a, a pretty major country for a lot of people working on their degrees. And then uh, I was the first person, first native speaker she ever talked with. I said, really? Her English was just great. But she also had anxiety on her English. Her thought was, if I answer quickly, if I answer fast, I'm fluent. I want to prove. She was very concerned of what the other person was thinking. And so we, we worked a little bit on that. Um, and that were the, that's where the communication came in, because sometimes she talked so fast, I couldn't understand her. So I said, you know, let, let's slow it down here. Um, and then what were the steps we said, okay, compose emails to universities, what are some online practices, this came into more kind of like a consultant slash language coaching type of thing. Okay, we'll go to the next. And again, I just put this down metaphors work beautifully, just I got stairs and mountains and foggy windows and you know that worked just beautifully listening i can't overstate the idea of listening i just can't i 
uh, it really helps me, you know, it's like sometimes the mind wanders and so forth. But I said, you know, just sitting there and listening because all three of them were quite talkative. And so that, that just became very important. <clears throat> and I realized, um, and that I said, boy, I really need to pull things out while they're talking much more than usual. She was a really good, she, she said, I have to manage my mind. Oh, okay. And then also realizing reality. She was, she was just real realistic. And then some of the challenges might be the coaching approach. Uh, reminding her I would go into consulting and I, I didn't want to go into an instructional role with her. Um, and then with the time zones, it was 10 hours difference. Sometimes we had a bad connection, but it's normal. You know, it's okay. Let's go to the next um, slide there. This one was very difficult um, for many reasons. A university student. I want to really invite you, encourage you, offer to you. If you see at the bottom of the slide, there's an article by New York Times. And the title is, She's at Brown, Her Heart is Still in Kabul. This was an amazing feat of a man from Bangladesh who lives in the United States that wanted to get any Afghan female out of the country who was wanting to study, who was wanting education. And he did, he got 148 out. This student is a part of that group. And the military was also, they collaborated with the military and they got the, they got all the women. Now this isn't easy. This is the first time they're separated from their families. This is a big one. And it, it just wasn't easy. So when I kind of, I heard the background but I really didn't realize it until I was in the game. I was like, whoa. Okay. Um, and she went to different places. She went from Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia. These are all military bases. Uh, Spain was in Wisconsin, Atlanta. And so she's been in Atlanta for six months, maybe away from Afghanistan a little over a year. So her English was intermediate, which is another thing I want to caution. I truly, I think we have to, as language coaches, probably because some of the things that we're dealing with are emotions and they are obstacles of sorts and how to converse in English effectively. Um, and so this, this indeed was a challenge. She's attending Georgia State University and she wanted to improve her writing. She's in the intermediate level in her ESL program. And I said, what, what would you like to do? What is your profession? And she said, I wanna just help women and children. Uh, and you know, it's just a beautiful, beautiful person. And so what we focused on was finding resources. What would be some, I gave her writing strategies. I had to change my hat a lot. All right, so we're gonna go to the next slide. And this was, you know, um, this one I learned and was trauma, the idea of trauma, which in a uh, couple of minutes we'll, we'll address. Um, and we just, I put on the instructional hat and we just said study habits. She shared her writing with me. I had to do that to stabilize her. She was easily upset and she, although she wanted it, but you know, I recognized the look and it was frozen. I mean, it's like a deer in the headlights. So English became another stress factor for her in the language coaching, while the other two, English was very natural. So this was a little bit slightly different. And I put on the bottom language coaching triggers, traditional, she had learner anxiety, but she needed more time to adjust. So we're going to go to the next slide. All right. So what I want to share with you is um, I'm going to share the cultural wizard tool. And this is by a company, RW. This is the cultural part. And this would be excellent to know with whoever you work with that are from different national cultures. So this here is um, RW3 tool. And you can see this, it includes eight cultural dimensions. And so another thing that I do, I work 
pretty deeply with different cultures. So you can see hierarchy, egalitarian, group orientation, individualism, interpersonal, indirect, directness, fluid, and so forth. So I'm just going to scroll down a little bit. So it's like a continuum. And you can get the full analysis. You can click on and you can get the um, analysis. And it gives you strategies and gaps and it's really an excellent tool. I do this with each one of my clients. Now I can't, I couldn't get rid of that little green ball. You can guess who that little green ball, <laughs> that's me. Um, so you, you do an assessment and then you, you can be on the continuum um, based on your answer. So I'm gonna add a country. So let's say, okay, Afghanistan, I'm gonna work with refugees from Afghanistan. So you can see the, here now it doesn't mean because somebody's from the US it's this way or somebody's from Afghanistan it's this way this is generalizations but you can see you know like even in the coaching that we do some possible gaps now even though there may be a gap it doesn't mean that it's not compatible it may be then you have personal personality to think about so so this is a tool that I find really helpful and it kind of brings a conversation, you know, you can talk from it. And then I'm gonna add the United States. And so even, you know, so we have three and you can put, if you're working, I, I thought this would be a great tool for group coaching. If you have kind of several nationalities or even if they're from, the uh, same country, you know, this kind of gets a, a, a conversation going and awareness. So even within the U.S., you can see, see U.S. is way to the right and Afghanistan is way to the left. Uh, there is a few things that are relatively right here, formal, formality and informality. So it's kind of interesting. Um, all right, so I just want I just want to let you know about that, and I'm going to stop share. I'm going to ask Carrie. Carrie, can you bring the slides back on? And we're almost towards the end here. All right, so my learning, Afghan refugees, extra consideration needed in the purpose of the question and be aware of possible triggers. So we've got to learn our clients. And then I, I'm sorry for my technical inability here, but it's gonna go up and then it'll go down on each one. Uh, language coaching provides, per, I love language coaching for refugees because, you know, Carrie mentioned in the beginning, it's humanitarian. Imagine they get an hour one-on-one -on -one and, they all three of these ladies appreciated it so much and it helped it helped a lot and so I think language coaching absolutely has a big place in the refugees for many many reasons next um yeah I had to remind the you know this is coaching not instructional but I think it's okay you know just switch the hat in this case, with refugees, I think we have to switch the hats. It's okay. And then more information. Um, I, I like this phrase because I was feeling an inadequacy on trauma. I said I need to know, although I feel I'm kind of natural in kind of a therapist, you know, I'm a calming, I have a calming effect. But I, I also realized, I said, you know what, I need to really get some theory, get some education, get some practice. So this term of trauma-informed adult ESL, I think it's a really good term. Uh, I also learned that I, my, this is my advice is to wait at least two years. Usually it's one year for the adaptation uh, stages. Or, but in this case, I would wait two years. It depends on the person. The surgeon was more than ready to go. She was three years in the US. When they know the ropes, they get used to things, their kids are in school, then they have some space that they can address. Next one. Upper intermediate, definitely, definitely. Get a good hold of English. And next one. 
Um, I had to kind of, and maybe you can, maybe anybody can kind of suggest, like I had to think, okay, which one is therapy and which one is language coaching? I, I was having trouble with those lines. And so maybe that's what we can talk about too. My mantra, do no harm. Next one. Um, I don't bring up the relocation. I don't bring up what happened. How did you get here? I don't, unless they bring it up. And then I listen to what they're saying. I take out what they're saying and I gently bring it back to the language if I can. I never leave anybody hanging. If they're visibly upset, we need to address. Another thing that came in was in one case with the university student, she got upset. I said, let's turn off our screens. You turn off your screen, I turn off. When you're ready, I'll be here. And if it's an hour, it's okay, I'll be here. And that seemed to be, she was embarrassed. And so that seemed to kind of help, you know, with the, turn the screening off there. And um, we talked about listening, um, deep breaths, if it's appropriate, take a deep breath, do some meditation one minute, just kind of get back to the center. Tears are a part of it. That's just tears. And, oh, I try to do a formal action plan, but it just wasn't working. I mean, I had them do, I said, here's a plan for next week, you know, but what helped was, was to list the activities that we did during the session and, and share screen and list the activities and what they thought about it and then review. And then the next session, open up the activities and say, this is what we did last week. What would you like to do today? This kind of thing that seemed to work really well. Switching hats. And I think there's two more Carrie, I'm not sure. Uh, on location, in this case, I think it does work better uh, than virtual. I think on location really does work better. You can drink hot tea. You can, um, it just, it's a different interaction. I, I think it, it would be a, a more, uh, virtual works, but I think in, in some cases I could feel, gosh, I need to be on location, you know. And then uh, check in with the, don't just leave them, you know, because they've been left enough. And so I will check in email, uh, phone call once a month. How are you doing? You doing all right? And they're always happy to hear. They're, they're lovely. Okay, let's see what the next one. I think the next one is open for questions or discussion maybe. Yeah, um, maybe we can stop sharing if people have questions or comments. I, I put some discussion questions down. Um, if, if you want to respond to that, I think Judy, go ahead. Should we stop I'm share? For Unmute myself. Um, two comments. I was, um, I think how quickly that, that you had four sessions and four sessions and eight sessions spoke to your credibility. Like that really is coaching to get to the, to the heart of the issue and resolve it for somebody. Um, I thought that was terrific because you know, we can go on for years and not make the difference that you made in, in four hours. So I love that about you. Um, what do you consider your Americanism? When I wanted them to do something <laughs> and I'm a taskmaster um, and I felt like that was interfering. And uh, I said, I really need to take a deep breath and what is, for them, what is, what do they think for, what was for them to do? And inside they know, they know. I was there to kind of bring the resources out, but my Americanism, I just kind of say it because I like the sound, but also sometimes I get, you know, it's like a checkpoint, you know, when you're working with somebody from China, different China, all, all the countries and you go, oh, that's pretty different. That's different than me. Is it different from me or different from my American culture? Yeah. So I wondered how it aligned with the culture wizard. Didn't when you talk about your Americanism, was it related to that chart? Yeah. Well, it, I mean, I don't say it because of that chart. Um, 
because I spent 10, 10 total years in six countries. And that touched my Americanism a lot. Mm -hmm. What do you mean you kiss on both cheeks? What do you mean you come this close to me? What do you mean that I, 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 I need to come an hour late, not on time? And so that got tested a lot. And I was on a huge learning curve and I enjoyed it. And so that's my Americanism. Yeah, good for you. I love the awareness. Good, good for you. <laughs> that's me. May I just very quickly and then so one comment I loved it I loved all the learning curves I loved all the you know vulnerability that you're showing in this whole process and quite a lot of compassion which is such a difficult thing to master I think and to actually you know put yourself into that situation and put yourself and there was a point when you were talking about the um the student the third refugee client of yours that well, it got me pretty close to tears. So, I mean, that that kind of process must be really heavy to, uh, difficult to deal with. Um, and yeah, being very clear on the boundary of, you know, coaching therapy and what, what your boundary is, what is it that you can support with and what not to. So that's just a, a, a little comment there. One thing that struck me was you said that it's good to do language coaching two years after they've settled in and whatnot. And for me, that seems surprisingly quite a long process. I would think that language coaching could support most exactly when they're, you know, acclimatizing, when when they're um, uh, arriving or, or soon after arrival. So the closer, the better, actually, so that that coaching can really support them. What what are your thoughts on that? Maybe I'm totally wrong. I don't know. So I, I haven't been in this situation. So and I think that's the reason to start the conversation, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, like this is kind of, have we ever heard about language coaching in refugees? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think that this is kind of going to unset what are some good best practices to develop? And mm -hmm. I, I think the, the impression, I think that both, maybe both can work. Maybe it's, it's truly possible because mm -hmm. I always think about how overwhelmed they, they must feel. And so let's get, you know, if you go to mass law theory, let's get the housing settled. Let's get the school settled. I don't mean to go in linear ways. I don't mean to do that. Um, and maybe, but maybe it can be included as part of welcoming. You know, they have a welcome. Every refugee that comes through the airport is welcome. They have a welcoming committee. And so maybe it is possible to have part of their welcoming is, and it could be a group, maybe there's a whole group that comes in and working in small groups. I, I think there's all kinds of possibilities. Lots of times with the welcoming committees, they, they list their resources and where to get them. Certainly listing the language coaching as a possible resource right, right from the get-go is mm -hmm. not, uh, not inappropriate I was thinking okay we've got also the idea of coaching too you know what is coaching is I'm not playing football <laughs> uh what is coaching what does it mean because this is also for all clients that we have what is co coaching exactly and the re refugee is no different so what is it exactly what is it that I can expect or not and um Okay, so in the in the chat, we've got a few big comments coming in, but I also see that Larissa has raised her hand. So I'm going to ask Larissa if you want to go first, and then we'll address some of these comments as well. Um, I would like to address the question, what other resources and methods can be used? I have been doing this work for at least 10 years in the area where I am now. Uh, I'm originally from Ukraine, and now Ukrainian refugees and immigrants are really a big influx. Uh, what I found out a long time ago that people who fled the war, before it, um, they were Sudanese, for example, they could not start learning, whether it's formal education or tutoring, um, 
before they really can come their mind. So uh, psychological aspects of coaching are very important. And I took training uh, in uh, mindfulness, meditation, but also art therapy and understanding that language is also a therapy if it is used mindfully. Okay. Like talk therapy is used for a long time. And um, I really appreciate a cat um, approach for um, uh, focusing on positive, focusing on dreams and goals rather than trauma. Though it is processed, it's not the focus. You focus on something that inspires them and seeing humanity in them. Um, so I have been doing uh, language coaching uh, as my primary occupation for seven years. And um, I start with um, a le uh, learning needs assessment. And they lead me what they need to learn. And uh, one of the questions is about their interest and hobby and hobbies. And they just light up. And we find out that some of them are wonderful artists or performers or organizers. And it can be a, a, a venue for them to start their own business. And uh, even though uh, their language can be low, but because their proficiency in some other aspects is high and motivation is high, they really are um, propelled by these dreams to achieve the goal very fast. So the language is a tool and the bridge uh, to pick up uh, the skills uh, they need to achieve their dreams without um, negating their nature. It's um, embracing who they are. And also psychological effect of um, accepting who they are, appreciating themselves and that they are talented. And a lot of anxiety comes from um, fear of being criticized or judged. So these psychological aspects are very important. So thank you. Thank you, Larissa, for that. I love it that you mentioned, you know, yes, there's, there's trauma-informed care, um, which I think is like whatever it is that we're doing, this is the training on how to mitigate and navigate a, a highly traumatized person. But I do love it that you mentioned art therapy as well. You know, that it's not just that it's it's actually not at all the focus on the trauma. The, it's the focus on the healing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, there is a, a, a method that's saying uh, to draw yourself healthy or draw to draw yourself what where you would like to to be, and it is with language. How do you want? First, it was like poem. Also, I am. Uh, uh, daring and uh, caring, right? And then another aspect that would be with the art, uh, when I am blessed, I am loved. So they need to project who they are and understand they're, they're beautiful, but also allow to accept and to see that universe is good for them. So hope and faith, people who have this aspect, a spiritual aspect. They are doing better in resilience, and but also in learning and adapting. Okay, thank you for that. Um, our next comment is Daphne Stringer. Uh, Daphne, do you do you want to just go ahead and unmute and say it? Uh, I just really appreciate uh, the input. Uh, thank you, and. Um, was interested also with the gap between uh, coming to a country and the language coaching. And I totally get that and appreciate that. I've worked with some uh, particularly students who have done English 
language learning, come to New Zealand for education, then found their language woefully insufficient for tertiary study and helped coach in that gap um, to, to gain what they needed. My recent focus has really been on the spoken language and developing the proficiencies that they need to gain that confidence and that identity able to express their identity. So um, Larissa, I really appreciate what you've just said that the sooner they can feel that they are achieving something that goes towards re-establishing their identity in a new setting, it's gold dust to be able to enunciate vowels correctly. So very much the instructional requirement that goes into how do I do this? Your language is so different. Everything is just, does, it, that hat doesn't fit. And it just adds to my anxiety very much like um, the one you were talking about. Um, and so for me, that trauma-informed uh, practice coupled with what specifically I need to know about in order to coach the voice so that it develops. I find that an interesting um, area that I'm involved in right now. And Judy, I've listened to your um, content available and I really appreciate it, Judy Thompson. Um, Judy Gilbert, another one for me around this active voice creation. And um, I'm just consumed by it. I've been involved for a little while and I find the lights go on in the early stages, even if they're able to enunciate something that is intelligible. Thank you. Yeah. You know, what's coming up for me hearing this discussion and, and Kathy, what you had said before about, well, maybe not right away and Maslow's pyramid and all this, what, what's coming out of it for me is, you know, the recognition that when these refugees are arriving, they actually are fed into language classes pretty immediately, right? It's so they're going to be in an instructional setting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we always talk at ILCA about language, pure language coaching, pure instruction, and then a coaching approach. And I think that that's where mm -hmm. this, this really kind of finds its legs, like language yeah. coaching with yeah. refugees and that coaching approach that they're going to receive the instruction but how wonderful if the person giving the instruction is mm. trained with trauma-informed care mm. um even mm. esl specific trauma-informed care certification amazing and and trained on how to be a language coach and mm. uh bring mm. to the forefront this you know positive psychology this positive um you know narrative of self this reconstructing mm. and celebrating mm. the goals also like that pumping mm. up so that that's kind of what's coming in for me a little bit that mm. they're going to be in an esl setting anyways so mm. it's about the instructor in that setting mm. receiving them mm. in in a sensitive mm. way um okay daphne uh had the next comment daphne would you like to unmute and say this uh, yeah, sure. It's lovely to be in a group with another Daphne. It doesn't happen very often. <laughs> I, Second Daphne, right? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just loving this discussion. Thank you very much, Ilka, for putting it on and Kathy for your insights. Um, so helpful. Uh, I was asked about three weeks ago uh, by a friend to help out with some language, English language teaching uh, for a Ukrainian lady who is actually in Edinburgh, I'm in Germany. Um, and I'm really short on time at the moment. So I said, yes, I can do that. As long as she's flexible, I can give her 30 minutes a day. Um, and we started about three weeks ago. She has very, very low levels. She's a, she's a beginner, complete beginner. Mm. But um, I'm finding it fascinating because I'm also a life coach and I'm just really letting her take the lead. Um, <laughs> and uh, for example, yesterday we had this really interesting exchange because she wanted to know all about the future forms in English. 
And I thought, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? You know, she doesn't speak English. I don't speak Ukrainian or Russian. Um, but uh, she just came out with one or two examples. And I mm. could, we were using WhatsApp. We weren't even on Zoom. Mm. And we were exchanging ideas. And that agency, that control, mm. I could see how it was doing her so much good. Um, and so I don't know about, you know, being trauma informed or anything like that. I just know that I would really like her to see me as um, somebody who is accompanying her on her journey. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? And, I base, and base, so basically what I'm doing is I'm helping her to improve her English. Um, I'm in, avoiding any triggers, anything that might uh, trigger anything mm -hmm. unless she brings it up. So, for mm. example, yesterday she started talking about a mountain in the Ukraine. So I thought, oh, let's have a look at a picture of it. Um, and I just sort of was feeling my way. So I feel I'm doing different. I'm working with her on different levels. It's fascinating. It is. <laughs> Take the mountain and use it as a metaphor. Yeah, thank you. Take a mountain yeah. in the Ukraine and this is your mountain. Yeah, thank you for that, Kathy. I love that. Yes. <laughs> Kathy's pulled together a pretty extensive list of resources as well that we'll show you. Yeah, I'm happy to share those. Um, I, have, okay. I haven't said much, but I would just add in to Daphne's comment. Thanks again, Kat, for everything. Uh, mm. So I'm Australian, mm. I live in Austria, and my German's only at B2 level. And so I've gone through the experience, not as a refugee, but as a self-imposed expat, and mm. had a variety of language courses. And even now, my language teacher is a teacher, she's not a coach. And the difference is that I get into my German, wie geht's, uh, wie geht's, good, yeah, good, yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah, good. Punkt. And then straight into the first punkt, not even like, hey, David. I mean, sometimes she'll say, hey, David, what do you want to work on today mm -hmm. in German? Mm -hmm. And so I get that opportunity to share. So I think Daphne, with when I coach my um, executives and people, it's really like, okay, what what would you like to do today? Mm -hmm. I've prepared some stuff. Mm -hmm. I've got I've got a I've got a mentee. Mm -hmm. I've got something going. But please, let's open it up to you mm -hmm. and, and really just mm -hmm. walking walking with them and. There's an expression I'd love to share that I got from um, my own coaching uh, programs and things, which is just be a guide from the side. Yeah, and I think mm -hmm. the well, exposure that we get, and I think it was Marilyn Richardson, who's a MCC coach in, in America, said, be a guide from the side as a coach. So that's pure coaching, not language coaching. But um, in the context of our language, I, I, I think we can't underestimate too, just the fact that if we spend time and we speak well, and we're able oh. to just share excellent English to to be a model a role model for them and to be a place to hold space then I think that's also you know worth the, the half an hour whatever you can afford to to offer that person to really make them feel um grounded and special mm -hmm. in that moment mm -hmm. I could see why Kat uh you, you you say wait a couple of years because in that first year, you're getting your visa, you're trying to get a job, you're just trying to get through. There's a lot of bureaucracy here in, in Austria, mm. for instance. You, mm. You're lining up at the MR35, and it's like a terrible place where people walk out crying, you know, all the time <laughs> because they, they don't care. The bureaucracy here is just like fill it in. And so when you don't speak the local language, you're really struggling. So you don't want to be in the mixed language coaching on top of those kinds of more traumatic, uh, maybe, you know, um, settling issues for for, yeah. for for a relocation that's what i want yeah. to add thank you david you know i have to add on with my university student there that, that's where my learning happened um the the day that she got really really upset was from bureaucracy she was in the government office you know and when when i i just got her as soon as she came home and we went on and that that's it really uh I don't know, triggered. <laughs> it really triggered that. So I just want to add that on bureaucracy that they have to go through. Another thing too, they might have to sign, they might have to have asylum. Uh, there's some more, after two years, they have to go through a process. They may, maybe they can stay, maybe they can't. Imagine. Mm -hmm. Carrie, I'm sorry, go ahead. 
No, no, I was just going to say that that's fine. Um, Carolyn has her hand raised and then Larissa. Um, so there's, um, I put some things in the chat, but uh, one of the things that we always learn is start where our uh, learners or our coaches are. And there's a whole different um, set of expectations of that whole situation, what the what this uh, client uh, coach or what the learner teacher relationship is, who has responsibility, who's accountable. Um, and that's nothing that we have to present to people, but that is where there are any number of schemas of these dimensions of difference and articles about it. I think I even wrote one in a TESOL publication about teaching culture um, many years ago, but just to understand where they're starting from of their expectations and then slowly move them along. And then the other thing is we can set so high expectations of ourselves and that goes with the people we're working with that if they've been in the adjustment cycle, which is continuous ups and downs, they just get a little bit, not so deep, but we think, oh, made it. But of course, we're gonna have another down at some point. And we, knowing that, can normalize it because it can be extremely upsetting and that also impacts the learning and the adjustment. So um, that's just my input here, so. Thank you for that, Carolyn. Okay, and then we'll take a final comment from Larissa before we go on to the resources and wrap up. So mm -hmm. go ahead, Larissa. Yes, um, there are two things. I want to comment on Daphne's uh, question, what would you do with future tenses? Um, in my practice, uh, it is uh, the best way to build up goals and dreams. And uh, in the English language, you can use uh, different phrases which are really useful for everyday conversation. I would like to do something. I want to do. Uh, I plan to do. Uh, and this is, can be part of the uh, learning needs assessment, also building up the program. And it helps them to express themselves if they want to go shopping and so on. So what you are doing is really a, a good way to make it practical and uh, enjoyable and personalized. Mm -hmm. The other aspect which um, was uh, touched upon that um, uh, uh, all refugees are geared towards uh, formal uh, classes in uh, my area, in the um, Seattle area, in um, Washington state, there are usually uh, classes at colleges now. Before they could be at schools, adult education, but now only colleges. And it is very formal, very difficult to get in with testing. I used to teach myself adult ESL adult education, and I could not survive more than three years doing this because the classes are uh, really very full, 35, 37 people. They are multi-level classes, and they are based on the CASAS tests, which is heavily, heavily culturally oriented, not knowledge, so that you will see as uh, students really get upset and get more anxiety because of these tests. And this is what we can address, how to change the system it should be open system without any testing, especially if they put them all together anyway. <laughs> and the tests, uh, and probably you know that culture, to understand culture, we need at least six, seven years, like for cultural adaptability. 
uh, index. Uh, and uh, the questions are about culture rather than language. So you can see uh, students who are very capable, they can be fluent or even proficient in the English language, but they just arrived, they don't know how to buy hamburger in McDonald's or how to put, put gas in the yeah. car. And they will be placed in the beginning level. At the same time, people from China or from Ukraine, the very smart people, they can figure out how to answer questions. They are put in level five, but they are beginners and they can go down. So this is adds to the anxiety. So what I would like to do that, how can we really bring this awareness to administrators and policy makers? Yeah. yeah. And also to provide more support for English teachers or volunteers, because it is art. It's not just to you know the language and you go, really a lot of other skills are needed. So that's why our work can be recognized and uh, can be a bridge yeah. between different cultures and languages and to bring the human humanity back. Larissa, I love what you're saying again, because <laughs> it's fundamentally challenging so much of even like administrative organization in our industry mm -hmm. and ESL, right? Like, let's yeah. be um, aware and informed and um, sensitive to the, the, even the administrative side of testing, which tests to use, how we're leveling these things. And, and I feel like we stumbled into something really beautiful of this thing of, you know, okay, we're, we're teaching future tenses. Um, let's do that with a positive orientation of reconstructing an image of self. Mm -hmm. um, let, let's be highly aware of the example sentences we use and intentional about the example sentences we use when it comes to present tense, you know, when it comes to past tense, like applying this, uh, I think it's somewhat like positive psychology into mm -hmm. the tenses. I think it's really beautiful. And I'm so glad we're having this conversation today. It's really I think a powerful one. So thank you to everyone for being here. I'm going to share the screen again to um, share resources. So just one little second here. And again, I'm sure that everyone on this call is going to want uh, a copy of the presentation. And we've got no problem to get that out to you. But here you go. If anyone wants to take a screen clip immediately. Here's some of the things we've talked about here. Um, in particular, this trauma-informed care, that's a kick I'm on right now in preparing myself for going into the language coaching context with refugees as well. And Carrie, um, I like it because there's no cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. self-paced, everybody. And so yeah. I'm gonna, I'll thank you, Carrie, for letting, you know, for sharing that because, yeah, and then we found and dug out, I don't know, did you put that on here, the... Um, yes, I did. The ESL specific. Yes, I did. Is that that repository, US? Yes. Uh, okay, yes. Yeah. check that, that out. That's someone's thesis that they did on trauma-informed care for adult ESL learners. Yeah, the last two are trauma, and then the one in Brown New York Times talks about these 147 girls uh, that yeah. were brought over to the US. It would be very interesting. Yeah, thank you. So if everyone's got their screen clip, that's it. This is how to get in touch with Kathy. Oh, sorry, I didn't know if there was more on that. This is how to get in touch with Kathy, which we'll put in you know, the YouTube replay of this as well so that anybody that's watching after can see how to get in touch with her. This, um, you can get in touch with Ilka as well by if you want to continue this conversation or some of the work you're doing featured or try to push this together, you can also um, get in touch with us. So, and I'm actually going to drop into the chat a different one for that. Mm -mm. Language coaching. Okay. There's an info at internationallanguagecoaching.com as well. So Kathy, 
Thank you yes, so much. Do you, do Thank you, you. I appreciate closing it. comments. Yes, one more. And if it's appropriate, you put your hand on the screen with the other person when appropriate. I'm going to take a screen. That's an, oh, you want to take a screenshot with yeah, all our I hands? Do, I do. Let me just, I'm so moved. I'm forgetting how to, I even do that. <laughs> oh my, oh my yeah, Well, if We can do a camera in one hand and then <laughs> the hand. Did. No, no, hold on. Okay. And I can't screenshot, so here. I got it. Okay. Oh, you got it? Okay, Let's one, two. It. Let's all do it. So cool. I love that. Can you give us a little context for that, for putting our hands? Like yeah, this was during the, the pandemic, you know, when things were full on and uh, trying to remain connected to others, it seems like years ago. And there was one lady that did that. Uh, she was doing a poetry group. And she says, you're not alone. And she put her hand up. And I just thought that was just beautiful. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Thank you for everyone here today. Thank you, Kathy. And thank you for everyone here today. Larissa, I see your comment. Great. Get in touch with us. Um, I saw everyone shaking their heads and really feeling this. So I feel like we're a pretty yeah, bomb group right now, right? Yeah, um, it's yeah. one of many discussions. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll do this again. And please, I would love for us to turn this into something more and continue like this together, you know, world over, kind of getting our getting uh, united on how we're how we're approaching this particular subject. So thank you. Thank you. Bye bye everyone. Bye.